Thank you once again for joining me today on our Side by Side. As we continue to try to find a song for Thomas, today we're going to think about how Jesus responds to Thomas. And by doing so, it'll help you and I think about how Jesus might be looking at us in the times when we find that we don't have a happy song or any song to sing. Now, eight days, eight days Thomas has been waiting. Let's read once again. Verse 26, John 20. Eight days later, his disciples were inside again and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. And then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands, and put out your hand and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. Eight days without a song to sing, and yet, you know, the other disciples might, if well born in later days, might have been heard to sing or hum, Christ the Lord is risen today, hallelujah, or he lives, he lives, Christ Jesus lives today, or Oh, to see the dawn of the darkest day. You know, who knows what they would have been singing if they were around today. I wonder if we wouldn't become a bit tired, even downcast with all of this upbeat singing around us. Here are the disciples who have seen Jesus, are beginning to process this in their own minds. Maybe they, you know, it's a little period in between of, and, and what, what, what would be going on in Thomas's mind during all this time. When you think about it, many a time when God's people feel downcast, it can be made so much worse when others around us are all speaking up their lives. I'm fine. All is good. It's great to be alive. Just so much blessings. And all of that is true each and every day. But for Thomas, who hasn't had your experience or your blessing, it feels worse than ever. And this is why when we are really honest about our struggles, we help each other so much more. So when Paul is honest about his trials or his failures, we say, thank you, Paul, because I know that my trials, my troubles, my feeling so downcast is not something strange or foreign. I truly am God's child still. But let's go back to that place again in John 20 and pick up there. The first thing we notice is that Jesus acknowledges Thomas. The acknowledgement of Thomas's struggles. He acknowledges his need. He acknowledges his request. It's as though Jesus, having not been in the room, but having known exactly what's going on in Thomas's heart, who said, unless I see his hands, in his hands, the marks of the nail and place my finger into the marks of the nail. Jesus then says, peace be with you. And then he said to Thomas. So Jesus directly addresses Thomas. He's not speaking to them all. He singles out Thomas and says, put your finger here and see my hands. Wow. Just think about that. The personal attention that Jesus gives. The acknowledgement that he gives to Thomas. Thomas wants personal reality. He wants hands-on, unless I see and place my hands is what he said. And the fact that Jesus does not dismiss his request or his desire is so hopeful, isn't it? It demonstrates something about Jesus, his wonderful patience and his grace. And surely all the gospel records show us a Jesus full of compassion. He really is open and tender towards us. Does that not remind us of Hebrews 4.15, where Jesus is described as a high priest who is able to sympathise with us? Now, Tom, Thomas is not being sinful. He's just seeking. He wants answers. He's searching. I think it also says that Jesus might have known something about Thomas's inner thoughts long before this. For we read in, in Hebrews that Jesus was having been tested or tempted in every way or respect, as we are yet without sin. I think Jesus knows what Thomas is going through. Thomas is experiencing 
a human experience that is not sinful. And he's wrestling with this downcastness. So that's the first thing he acknowledges, and that's so good to be acknowledged. Secondly, Jesus invites Thomas. He says, put your finger here, put out your hand and place it in my side. What an intimate moment. I can imagine a great hesitation on Thomas's part. Having already said, unless, you know, the real bold statement, he now faces not just Jesus in real time and space, I think he faces himself as well. Did I really say that? And I wonder if inwardly he said, oh, why did I not just keep quiet back then? I feel so stupid now. No. Are we all not glad that he did ask the question? Well, I for one am glad that he asked the question. Because of this outburst, now another piece of the picture is seen. Jesus invites, I think he even encourages inquiry. How many times does he not talk about searching and seeking and hungering and looking for and asking? How many times are these not words you use to encourage us? Jesus is asking then something of Thomas. He's asking a movement. He's asking a reaching out. He doesn't take Thomas's finger or hand and grab it and place it on his nail prints in his own. No, he invites a response, but it's just a small, small response that indicates movement towards Jesus. And that's what Jesus invites from us, the movement of simple faith that could be illustrated through a prayer. As we pray, we're moving towards him in simple faith. Or it could just be the simple action of waiting. Or maybe praising or thanking him. Or in some other way that only we know because it's our story. So Jesus acknowledges him and Jesus invites him. But thirdly, Jesus counsels Thomas. Notice what the text says. Put out your hand and place it in my side do not disbelieve, but believe. There's a sense in which all of these actions are all, as it were, one. As you put your finger in my hand, as you put your hand on my side, don't disbelieve, but believe. Reaching out to Jesus is an act of the will. When he says, do not disbelieve, but believe, he's asking him to will something, because belief is not just a matter of faith. It involves the will. Earlier, Thomas had declared, unless I do this, I will never believe. Yes, the will is involved. And the will has to do with our hearts. I mean, you take, for example, the person who says, I will never forgive that other person. That's a statement from their hearts where they choose not to forgive. Equally, they could choose to forgive. And in this case, with all before him, Thomas can choose to believe. Is there mystery here? Why some choose and some do not? For sure. But as Jesus reveals himself to Thomas, and Thomas clearly sees, Jesus reveals himself to those who seek today. As we earlier on, Monday past, we mentioned that text in Jeremiah 29, 13. If you seek me, you shall find me, if you seek with all our heart. So, what then? Well, is it not over to us? Will we respond in kind by reaching out and trusting him, embracing him as our Lord and Saviour, turning away from all that we have been depending on, which is repenting, all that has ever ruled our hearts, our own selfishness, our sin, me first, and now we follow him first and always. We'll discover then a new song will be put in our mouths, as the psalmist says, a song of praise unto our God. Now we'll think about the new song that Thomas gets tomorrow. But just to end, let me quote you from Jim Packer. So how is it then to find ourselves reaching out? He says, the way to benefit fully from the Spirit's ministry of illumination, that's l revealing to us, is by serious Bible study, serious prayer, Serious response and obedience to whatever truth already shown, to live it out, talk it out, think it out. And that's what I'm encouraging you and I to do today.
as we respond to Jesus ourselves.